Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Business Spotlight. I am Scott McMeans with Action Coach SBL, and I am honored to have Mr. Roger Atkins from the National Tooling and Machining Association. He's going to tell us a little bit about himself and his business and how this all came to be. So, Roger, if I could ask you to introduce yourself to the audience. Great, Scott. I appreciate being here today. Again, my name is Roger Atkins. I'm president of the National Tooling and Machining Association, which we commonly reference as NTMA. Uh, NTMA is an association of about 1,100 precision manufacturers across the United States, primarily privately held, entrepreneurial-based, family-owned businesses. Um, We represent about 32,000 employees and about $8 billion in, in revenue among our association of about 1100. So we're serving industries uh, from the, from uh, you know aerospace, medical, aerospace, defense, space, um, oil and gas and industrial products. So anything that requires precision machining, um, you know, we're involved in uh, across industry wide. Being president of the associations, I'm a little unique. I was actually a member of NTMA for 40 years as on the member side of the association. And uh, when they asked me if I would come and run the association. So now I find myself on the other side, on the dark side, and I now run the association. So I am, I'm not an associational expert, but I am a member, a member expert of knowing what it's like to be a member of association. So I'm thrilled to be here. It's a great way to give back to an industry that's been good to two generations of my family. Outstanding. Now, you did say two generations of your family. How does that come to be? Is this a business that you had and you were a, preci- a precision tool manufacturing company? And now are you still part of that company or? No, we actually, it, it, I was born into this business. My dad had a precision machine shop when I was born. So I grew up in the machine shop business. Uh, when my dad I was making go-karts and mini bikes at 10, 12, 15 years old in the shop, making deer stands, anything we needed to make to make our lives go around as, as three little boys uh, of uh, of my dad. And so, um, again, my dad had a shop. I worked for my dad the first 10 years that I was out of college, and we were very tied in the oil and gas business in the greater Houston area. And then, you know, we we enjoyed the booms and the bust of the oil and gas industry, and during one of the bust, um, we decided that I would depart the company just because it had, you know, it had really kicked us down. And so, um, but it sort of helped me spread my wings among in the manufacturing industry. And I eventually went to work for some of our friendly competitors over the years that actually my dad had introduced me to. And so that was sort of the beginning of my career. And uh, when I first started, my dad took me to a meeting, says, I'm going to take you to a meeting that you'll meet more people to teach you more about manufacturing than I'll ever be able to do. And that was NTMA, my first NTMA meeting that he took me to. And he introduced me to these people. And I made it an entire career around really those introductions and my my at 10 years with my dad and then the introduction uh, to NTMA members across the country. Outstanding. What a, How fortunate that you are to have been born and raised in this business. And now you are bringing up the next generation of people in this industry with the knowledge and the experience and being able to connect so many different people. I I applaud you for being able to do that. Um, There's a lot to get after here today. So what I'm going to talk about or ask you is what is it that you do in order to balance the life that you lead with? And again, it's interesting. You were a member, now you're on the other side, but how do you manage your work-life balance in the grand scheme of things with respect to what's demanded of you and what you're able to produce. Uh, Scott, that's a, you know, a good question. It, it makes me ponder, but, you know, I would say in my, in my entire career, I've never made work and family two different worlds or that I, you know, it's hard enough to balance one world, much less two worlds and two different axes. So I sort of made, uh, you know, I, I sort of made my work life and my business life in one world. I, again, and so, you know, my my kids grew up knowing who I worked with. They knew the names of people I worked with. They knew what I did. And, you know, not to not in a way of, uh, you know, being laborious for them to know, but it was a part of my life. And they realized it's an important part of my life. And guess what? People at work knew about my wife and they knew about my three girls and they knew my 
my kids' involvement in extracurricular activities and and those kind of things. And so instead of trying to balance, and, and that helped me balance it. You know, I was balancing one world on one axis instead of trying to to balance two worlds on two different axes. And, um, you know, did did both sides probably get tired of the other one at times? Probably so. But it really did help <laughs> me balance life. And, and so it made it where when I was talking about Joe or, or Gary or Mark at work, my kids knew exactly who it was. And, you know, when I was talking about my kids at work and, you know, they knew exactly I was talking about Angela and Alyssa and Adrian and their activities. And so it, it just made it where, and, and, and my beautiful wife who, 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 who grounds everything for us. And, you know, it just made it that um, it made the world go around pretty smooth actually. And so, you know, Wow. Sometimes I spent more time on family and I spent more time on work. But at the end of the day, the world stayed balanced on one axis and and not that you didn't have to bend it every once in a while. But it, it I just didn't feel like they were comp- they were always competing with each other. I tried to make them sort of one in the same. OK, it's a very different approach, but nonetheless, a very successful approach because you've been able to merge both worlds together because they served each other's purpose. And I think that's, that's a solid move. Um, Something I want to ask you about is now that you're on the membership side of the uh, NTMA, what is it that you're doing to bring about the growth and expansion of this organization? So that, as I mentioned before, you're teaching the younger generation, what's, what's the expectation, what, what's, what's the possibility for this world? Scott, I have, uh, is uh, anybody that remembers the oh wow world of sports uh and you know advertisement i've had the thrill of victory and i've had the agony agony of defeat in the manufacturing industry so i've been on top of the mountaintops at times and i've been in the lowest of valleys in, in that so i've experienced both so leading an association of 1100 companies and we see in transition change to a younger generation i will tell you this um it, it sort of ages me, but that nobody's going to bring many oppor- many things to me that I haven't personally experienced or been a part of experience or seen uh, or have seen uh, happen in the industry. So you know, um, having experienced a lot of things, and again, both good and bad, uh, you know, in, in manufacturing. I do bring an I do bring an answer that a lot of people can't. You know, if we had an associational expert in here, he may know how to run an a, an association, but he may not lo- he may not really know the thrills and the victories and the agonies and defeat of manufacturing. And that's what I can bring to people today. And as I share with some of our members, if they don't necessarily have to do what I say to do, but if they would do the things I tell them not to do, they would be a better company for it. Learn from my <laughs> mistakes. There's plenty of new ones to make out there, but um, I would I would say it's brought a lot of confidence to our members knowing that somebody's run the association that understands their business, that's been where they're at, and and that's what I bring. I I, I know the challenges they face. Uh, I know the uh, I know the heartaches that they face. I know the you know the the difficult decisions they face, and so we as NTMA have been able to really look at. We don't have to ask a lot of people what they're facing. We can we can really attack the things we're facing. Mm-hmm. And the values that we have brought over the last three and a half years have been those that we knew that they needed. So we have really done it. We've seen our membership grow. We've seen people get more involved in our association. Obviously, the pandemic um, wasn't the greatest things that ever happened to any of us. But you know what we learned uh, during the pandemic, it was good to be a part of a community. That could stick together when no one knew what to do and what way we were going. You know, ninety-eight percent of our members were deemed essential, so they stayed open. As I told people, we were social distancing before the government even thought of the word. You know, because we were we were forced to stay open to because we were the ones that supply comp, you know supply things to make our nation's uh, economy go around, and so we were dealing with it in the midst of the fight. So I, I think that's what you know having the experience in manufacturing does i i can i can put my seat and myself in their chairs and help them you know uh, you know navigate the diff, the the difficult waters and difficult currents that come our way yeah so when you talk about helping people out through the different seas they must navigate or go through 
how do you work with different members? Uh, not everybody has the same challenges. Not everybody has the same problems. Um, so how is it that you take some of the learnings that you've had and spread them across the association? Is that is that something that comes easy or is that something that that you really have to create and craft brand new ways to approach people? Just talk to me a little bit about how you approach the different people, members of the association. Because again, 1,100 different voices, 1,100 yeah. different sets of eyes and ears. I'm curious how you get your your community to buy into what philosophical approaches you have. Well, you know, we have ser- we have several communication mechanisms. Number one, we have a, a monthly magazine that I'll write an article about, and I'm writing. I'm really writing to our members, you know, and and dealing with it. The focus of that month, you know, we have social medias, we do blogs, we do posts. But you know, I would tell you, manufacturing is a little like marriage, Scott. You know, if we all uh, uh, decided we wanted to throw in what our problems in marriage was, the reality is we probably only need about three or four or five buckets in the middle of the room when we talk about what the challenges of marriage are. Well, you know, manufacturing is a little the same way. You think there's you know, you'd need 100 buckets for 1,100 people. The reality is we probably need about five to 10 buckets uh, of the challenges facing manufacturing. And what we find is where that, whereas they may be a little different, they're they're all in all almost the same. So as I say, in marriage, you need three to five buckets to throw your problems in. In manufacturing, you probably need five to 10 buckets. And that really covers about 1,100 people's, 1,100 mm. companies' challenges. And so it's not quite as diverse as one may think it is. And I I do that from a recent survey. The number one problem uh, facing challenging our members, as well as the other 20,000 companies in America in small businesses, uh, recruiting and and retention of a workforce. It is by far the number one challenge. And and number two, you know, challenges are the possibility of inflation and, and, and a recession. So those are the top three. So when you do a survey across the country and the top five of only, there's only been one new top five and it was number six come in in the last three years. So what you find is the, the challenges are really the same with just a, a little different flair that may be a regional flair or an industry mm. related, you know, something that makes one industry a little different than another industry. But when it comes running your business, the challenges are the same. Yeah. Great. Um, great thought processing. And I appreciate you articulating, articulating that the way you did, because it's, I think most people need to understand they're not unique. Their challenges are fixable with the right amount of guidance and the right amount of input. And for lack of a better word, assistance from somebody else that's been there, done that, as you've made comment, it's great to have somebody at the helm of an organization like yourselves that has the experience and can give answers as opposed to trying to figure it out on the fly. So there's a lot of benefit in that. You know, Scott, on that, on that point, what we find is being a a peer to peer organization, you know, your peers help you solve your problems too. Mm -hmm. So that's what we find, uh, you know, my dad who was in NTMA many years ago, told me, he said, Roger, if you have a problem, don't go try to fix it. There's a, there's a one of your peers that's already had the problem and fixed it. Just find that person and it'll be a lot faster and a lot better solution than trying to figure it out yourself. And so a lot of NTMA comes together in that peer-to-peer networking and you think we're we're competitors. We are. We're friendly, respectful competitors of each other, but all willing to help each other. And so we try to put our members in those kind of environments that they can reach on peer-to-peer as well as mm. come together in groups or, you know, one of us be able to speak into a problem. With that in mind, Roger, a little bit off the beaten path with the questions here, but talk to me a little bit about how often your membership gets together, how or where you might get together and what happens when those meetings take place. Are there certification programs? Are there learnings, education? How does how does a meeting or um, a convention of, and TMA uh, members go? How does that work? Well, we're a national organization with a chapter structure. So we have 27 chapters throughout, throughout the United States. So who's covered by a national office here in Cleveland, Ohio. So we have 27 chapters, primarily in greater metropolitan areas. Um, 
that have that have a, a group of our members in that area. And so we're able to communicate through our through our chapters. And so that's an opportunity that that companies get to come together with their local peers, if you will, their local competitors. And then we create national events. We have about two national meetings a year. Um, our, our next one is actually October 16th through the 19th in Indianapolis, Indiana, where some 200 uh, people will come together with speakers and, and um, on technology, business acumen, you know, and different things that speak into companies. And then what our members always say, the greatest value is, is being with their peers for a couple, three days and be able mm -hmm. to talk shop and see what other people are doing and what how other people are overcoming the, the challenges that we all face. And then the other thing, we've really focused a lot our own training cohorts. We have an emerging leader. We have two emerging leader cohorts going. We're having, we're going to have an executive leader owners cohort going. And these are smaller meetings, 10 to 15 people that meet on a monthly basis, either in person or virtually. And for our emerging leaders, we've had a nine month training program, how to, you know, how, about leadership training, how to understand financials, how to deal with people, understand you get things done with people and through people and, and educating them on those kind of things. And, um, uh, and they have really, they have really loved it. I, they've just said, you know, this is, um, this has been helpful. A lot of owners say, you know, I can pick good people, but I don't have time to train them, and I don't really know how to train them. And so we've tried to 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 fill that gap and say, okay, we'll get we'll get experts in the field to come in and train. And these are people that are partnered with NTMA that focus in those areas and. Uh, and, the, and we let them really mentor different groups. NTMA in itself, I and I myself cannot be everybody's answer, but I can get you to the right answers. And I can partner with the right people that can get you the right answers and the right training you need with the challenges you're facing. Well, it sounds like, Roger, you've built an organization that is one heck of a resource, whether it be training, education, facilitation of questions and challenges. There's, there's this repository of knowledge that 1,100 people contribute to, and they all get a chance to pull uh, pull something out of. And I think that's what makes it work, right? That's, that's what makes it successful. Um, when you think about all those people working together, what are some of the things that you look for on the team of people that work at NTMA? Like your, your staff, what is it that you look for in that, in that group of people? Because let's be honest, when you're working with a very specific group of business owners, they have a very specific set of needs, or, or at least they believe they do, right? As we've already identified, nobody is necessarily unique in their challenges. So when you're building a team or a, and a staff, who do you look for in relationship to the people they're going to be serving? Yeah, you know, it, it, we first look for whatever, you know, the expertise and whatever the position that we're looking, <clears throat> we're looking to fill. Um. And then to me, it's as I tell our as I tell our team, it's all about team. You know, we're here. We we win together. We win together. We lose together. Uh, any one of our success without the team being successful is a failure. And mm -hmm. everybody always has to hear my baseball analogy. Uh, I'm a big baseball fan with the you know the California Angels. If you look at them, they have by far two of the best ball players <clears throat> in all of baseball. Um, mm -hmm. so Shea Otani and then Mike Trout and, you know, and they win all these national, you know, all these national awards. And yet the angels are in last place every year. Now to me, yeah. I guarantee you, both of those men would say that they would give up all their awards to win the world series. And that's why I try to tell our team, I said, you know, one of us to win and get an award while the rest of the team is in last place. Doesn't do it. But we try to focus on our members. What are the needs of our members? And how do we how do we respond to their needs as quickly as possible? And how do we communicate it? How do we how do we take our partners that are experts in different parts of the uh, different sectors of manufacturing? How do we successfully connect those partners to our members? You know, because we we have probably about thirty partners. You know, mm -hmm. that's uh, that's across across a wide array of of services and 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 equipment. 
But how do we tie those to our members? How do we make sure our members know them? We try to put them on a first name basis with these people. We try to get them to, to have an understanding of the industry so that when somebody comes in to help you, they're not learning about the industry. They know the industry. So we we try to bet out the partners that we that we do it. And so what we tell our members, they're vetted out. You can just start using them. You don't have to spend your time to say, is this a good partner or not? You know, we will we will have done all the vetting out for you. And we tell people, you work on your business <clears throat> on the inside of the walls and let us work on things outside the walls. And um, the two will make the two will will bring success. I like it. I like it. The um the misconceptions of what it is to be the president of NTMA, how would you articulate or how would you explain to somebody what it's like to do the job you do versus what they think it is to do the job that you do? That's a good, that's a great one. That's um I guess for me, you know, having grown up in this industry, it's continuing to do what I what I've learned to do for for my entire career. So for me, uh I think I have the dream job. I I, it, mm. I couldn't be in a better position to give back to an industry, as I say, that's been good to two generations of my my family. I've 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 learned I've learned these things, and to be able to share them back with people to 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 try to help people be more successful. So I it, it's fun to come to work every day, and I feel like all I'm here to do is try to how to make you more successful, how to make your company more successful, how to make sure your company can sustain uh for the next years and if i left anything i want to create i want u.s manufacturing to be in a position that a young man like me at 22 years old could spend my entire career in manufacturing i want to give other young people that opportunity and position u.s manufacturing to be in such good shape and have such a future that somebody a young person could spend their entire career in manufacturing as i've had the privilege to do and so that's what flips my switch every day. You know, I love to do it. I love to invest in these young people that are taking over and, and, and give them every bit of ammunition I can to fight the battle every day. And, uh, you know, many times I wish I was as smart as they were at their age. You know, what they know today uh, with a lentil mentoring, they should take this in. This industry is going to be in good hands. So I appreciate what you had to say. And I know there is probably more things in your head that you will forget than I will ever know about manufacturing. So I'm not even going to test those waters, but I would like to ask you, so you can explain to the people that it, or somebody that is a 22 year old trying to figure out what to do. What advice would you give a 22 year old college graduate or a 22 year old individual getting into the manufacturing space? What recommendations would you have for somebody entering this precision manufacturing space other than first thing they do is get an NTMA uh, membership other <laughs> yeah, than right, that, right? right. That, that, that is number one. That's good. I appreciate that. Well, you know, I, I think back to my career, um, Scott, I, I went to, I went to college. I went to a four year school, got a business degree and um, you know, and I, I appreciate that degree, but the reality is when I went into business, when I went into manufacturing, I realized I didn't know a lot about manufacturing. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think the first thing I would tell anybody is you don't know it all. You know, we're, we're pretty full of, uh, of energy. And, you know, I thought I could save the world and I thought I could do a lot of things. And I quickly realized that I really needed somebody to mentor me. I needed to be around people. I appreciate my dad taking me to a meeting and say, I'm going to introduce you people that will teach you more about manufacturing than I'll ever be able to teach it. It was truly those, those individuals that uh, that that spoke into my life and and told me sort of what the to do's and the not to do's and when I had a problem I had people to go to, um, so I just think you know you, you don't know it all and it, sometimes it's 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 better to listen than speak, you know I was quick I was quick with the mouth I was quick with this I was I was quick to you know I wanted to fire everybody and if I'd have fired everybody we wouldn't have had anybody ever work for us. You know, if somebody made a mistake, I was ready to fire them. And, and it, it was out of passion. It was out of deal, but it was really out of ignorance. And uh, my mm. dad, I'll never forget one day, he, he told me, he said, I, he sent me down and he said, son, he said, you can fire anybody. Nobody in this company is untouchable. You can fire anybody you want. 
He said, I'm just going to ask you one question. And I said, what's that? And he said, who are you going to replace them with? And he said, if you can't tell me that, he said, I'm going to have your ass. And you know what? I never forgot that. That was the first year that I was, uh, that I worked. And all of a sudden I understood what he meant. Yeah. So it's about, instead of judging people, how about investing in people? How about training people? How about understanding everybody makes mistakes, using it, use it as a teachable moment. You know, obviously if mistakes continue, you may have to deal with it, but invest in the people and don't judge the people. So that's, that's what I would tell young people. Just be a little more patient than we are. Understand that, you know, it, common sense. You know, we, we, sometimes we'd say that was just common sense. Mm -hmm. One thing you learn at the older you get, what's common to one is not necessarily common to another. So be careful when you <clears throat> expect your, your way of acknowledging common sense is going to affect the way somebody else sees common sense. So it is an investment in other people. And I think young people have to realize you get things done through and in other people. And that's the way you're, that's the way you build success is because you can't do it all. You think you can do it all, but burning that candle at both ends, that candle does meet in the middle sooner or later. Better mm -hmm. to learn to burn it at just one end and figure out how to do it through people. Because you take any manufacturing company, we could, we could duplicate everything in our shops today. You know, I could take, you could look at a shop and say, I can, I got enough money. I can duplicate everything in there. So the only one thing that makes us different than the shop next door that looks exactly like us is our people. Yeah. And the winners in all business is those who know how to get it done with and through the people that work for them. Brilliant way, Roger, to end the communicate or the conversation. Brilliant way. Invest in your people and they in turn invest back in you. I love it. Thank you very much. Um, gentlemen, uh, I appreciate it. I uh, really think this was a great conversation, and I think people are going to appreciate learning from you and getting a chance to get the insight that you laid out today. So thank you, Roger. I appreciate your time on the Business Spotlight today. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. It's an honor to, to be on here today. Outstanding. Bye now. Bye.